you're listening to Threads Radio. My name's Luke Fraser, and this is The Tonic.
such a gorgeous rippling surface to that, but the devil is really in the detail. That was the second movement of Music of Steady Light, written in 1978 by LA native Michael Byron, based these days in New York. He's a one-time pupil of James Tenney and came of age alongside West Coast composers such as Lou Harrison, Harold Budd and Robert Ashley. His early works were more strictly minimal, but by the mid-70s, he was moving towards writing pieces that generate complexity from limited means and that require a high degree of performer virtuosity. All those glittering melodic patterns are rhythmically distinct and exactly notated, I believe. The piece as a whole has three movements, clocking in around 35 minutes, 
and with each containing a different combination of percussion instruments, you heard marimbas, xylophones, glockenspiels, and vibraphones in the second there. It's music that's non-directional, but within which something is always happening. It's immediately comprehensible and yet perceptually challenging when you get closer. Try listening, for example, with an ear for where pulses or accentuations might lie. It seems they're constantly shifting. It's been likened to the mobiles of Alexander Calder, and I can't really think of a better analogy. Maybe in a musical sense, I could also suggest the experience of listening to wind chimes or the pealing of church bells. It's music that dances with tremulous iridescence, as someone rather brilliantly put it. It was performed there by the four-piece William Winnant percussion group. They are William Winnant, Tony Gennaro, Michael Jones, and Scott Siler. And it's taken from the album Halcyon Days, that's just been released on Cold Blue Music. Thank you. 
I came across that piece for the first time last month as the opener in a concert given in London by the brilliant Manchester Collective. It's called Carrot Revolution, written in 2015 by Gabriella Smith, a composer from Berkeley, California, and now based in Seattle. She's a violinist herself as well, and that no doubt has fed into the writing of this piece. Carrot Revolution was written for and recorded by her friends, the Izuri Quartet, as a response to the Barnes's Foundation exhibit, The Order of Things, in which paintings from the US chemist and art collector Dr. Albert C. Barnes's collection were displayed with other, often unexpected objects, metal and ceramic, various furniture and so on, and juxtaposed in ways that bring out similarities and differences in shape, colour and texture. She said that she envisaged the piece as a celebration of that spirit of fresh observation and of new ways of looking at old things, such as the string quartet, as well as some of my even older musical influences, Bach, Perrotin, Gregorian chant, Georgian folk songs, and Celtic fiddle tunes. The piece is a patchwork of my wildly contrasting influences and full of weird, unexpected juxtapositions and intersecting planes of sound inspired by the way the Barnes's ensembles show old works in new contexts and draw connections between things we don't think of as being related. And the name? Well, while walking around the Barnes looking for inspiration for the piece, she remembered a Cezanne quote she'd heard years ago, the day will come when a single freshly observed carrot will start a revolution. I really love the sprightliness of it and its carefree mixing of styles, and I love in particular that bit around the two-thirds mark where the key drops down a couple of times via group glissandi, basically a big pitch slide, and we ease into these new key areas like a plane touching down on a clear, bright day. The Izuri Quartet are Emma Fucht and Miho Siguza, violins, Ayani Kozaza, viola, and Karen Wiesonian cello. And it's taken from the album Blueprinting that was put out on New Amsterdam in 2018.
that's the lead single, Glacka, and opening track of 2015's Hive One by US composer, musician, and ex-Battles frontman, Tyon Dai Braxton. He's the son of the legendary Anthony Braxton, and he's been composing and performing music under his own name and collaboratively since the mid-90s, having more recently been pivoting away from experimental or alt-rock and towards both electronic music and scored acoustic compositions. Across a pretty diverse range of styles and influences, the music of Edgar Varez being strong among them. Some of those are really interesting, like last year's Telekinesis, scored for 90 odd orchestral players, along with choir, electric guitars, and electronics. High was initially a live performance installation that debuted at New York's Guggenheim Museum back in 2013. Part design installation and part ensemble performance, it featured five musicians sitting cross legged inside oval pods designed by Danish architect Ulfa Serland van Tams. These were programmed to complement the sonic mood of each piece, using an array of LEDs that emitted light through their perforated wooden walls. The pieces were then retooled for the album. It's a slightly uneven listen for me, though the blending of live percussion with electronics makes for an interesting sound world, and that track is a really strong opener, with all its fizzing scalic leaps and popping rhythmic lows. Both the single Graco and the LP Hive One were released on Nonesuch in 2015.
And that has a title, Prelude for Four Diesel Locomotives and Harp. That would have made Luigi Russolo and the Futurists proud. It's the opening piece of last year's For Train Spotters Only, the debut album by Belgian composer, performer, and conceptual artist Anne Isemans. She's a longtime double bassist and harpist, and in terms of her arts practice, she has an ongoing fascination for trains, which apparently started when she was a five year old setting out on a rail journey from Antwerp to Ostend. Her recent PhD, if I understand the abstract correctly, hinges around creating mixed and intermediate art based on data deriving from both trains and the study of phosphorescence, which is a pretty far out research concept, I have to say. I'm not sure if the album stems directly from that research, but in any case it must closely be affiliated, being a collection of stories and sound that explore the possibilities of the train both as signifier and musical instrument in its own right. There's a close relation here, I think, to Chris Watson's El Tren Fantasma that I featured a couple of shows back. For that prelude you heard, along with the accompanying fugue, she recorded the sounds of diesel locomotives HD 51, 54, 55 and 60 from the Belgian Train World Heritage Collection, setting them alongside that evanescent harp playing, recalling to my ears Baroque composers like Bieber and Purcell. I love the way the train noises are integrated so subtly and how they provide this coherent sense of counterpoint with the harp. It's a way of mediating between music, quote unquote, and sound, between composition, improvisation, field recording, and historical documentation that I find really compelling. It's a really singular record. As mentioned, it's called For Train Spotters Only, and it was released on Cortisona last year.
So if at our daily brainstormings, I pitched to you techno for MIDI controlled pipe organ, would your eyes light up or would you perhaps roll them instead in despair at the hipster cynicism of it all? Well, based on that record, the first reaction would in fact be correct. That was Dusseldorf by Maxime Danouk, an electronic music composer based in Brussels, and it's from his 2022 release, Nachthorn. He's one half of Plap La Pinky, along with Raphael Hennard, a duo noted for their sideways approach to club music. They've explored the potential links between both Baroque and religious music and contemporary dance culture through their releases. And as a solo artist, he's previously released Solarium, an organ piece intended, as he puts it, for afters, that period of slack that follows the frenzy of a techno fueled night, while subsequent release NL forged North Sea sound samples into music inspired by Dutch rave. Nachthorn, meanwhile, takes its name from one of the 78 stops that make up the main organ in St. Antonius Church in Dusseldorf. That instrument, equipped with a system developed by the German company Sinua, offers the possibility of controlling all of its keyboards and timbres via computer, turning the organ into a fully programmable analog synth with all its quirks and difficulties. The album ranges with both subtlety and continuity between vintage trance, the dub and minimal techno, or basic channel that you heard there on Düsseldorf, along with ambient and drone. Here's one more of the album.
and love that. That was Edo, the opening track from Maxime Danuk's Nachthorn for MIDI controlled pipe organ. It was released on Vlek in 2022.
So that instrument is a geomungo, a Korean fretted zither struck with a short bamboo stick and played there by Lee Jung A in a performance of parts one and two of Belgian composer Baudouin de Gers Sanjo. He writes for European forces, but also maintains a long-term interest in Korean instruments such as the Daegeum, Hagium, and Geogeum along with the Geomongo. And Sanjo, translating I think roughly as scattered melodies, is a traditional style involving an instrumental solo, often accompanied by a jangu, a type of hourglass shaped drum. The Geomongo has a pretty distinct sound. Whilst it can be soft and light, it can also be rough and percussive. And roughness, according to the liner notes of the album, is part of the Korean aesthetic, where quote, purity does not exist as such, there's always a certain degree of asymmetry, trouble, or liveliness. I really like it. There's a strong blues inflection to my ears, and the excellently mic'd recording allows us to hear every little sonic detail occurring between the main notes, the scraping, trills, and tremolos that make me feel like I'm right there in the room listening. The album it's taken from, compositions for Geomungo and Gaia Geom, was released on Sub Rosa in 2013.
Quite dazzling. That is the final part out of 16 from a quite extraordinary and I'm guessing lesser known totem of 20th century electronic music by Henri Pousseur. It's called Viet Namibi and it's from his monumental Paysage Planétaire produced in 2000. From Malmedy, Belgium, he was a member of the Darmstadt School in the 50s at the time of Boulez. Berio and Stockhausen, and he wrote for acoustic instruments as well as electronically. This piece therefore comes right at the tail end of his career. The story goes that sometime in 2000, he was asked by Brussels-based architect Philippe Samin to lend his support to a plan to build a business complex in the city of Nivelle, not far south of the capital. There were to be four low buildings arranged like different parts of a medieval village, each grouped around a large open central court. Pousset came up with the idea of a metaphorical clock of sorts that would represent a single terrestrial rotation of the planet and highlight a different part of the world and its people as the hours and minutes rolled by. It would sound in variations every hour, marking the hours between 6am and 10pm. He imagined a connection between the local time in Nivelle and those times at points all around the planet, planning the 16 hours of music to correspond to a 24-hour global cycle. To do that, he divided the globe into eight north-south slices, with each of these being divided into three perpendicular rings, north, centre and south, to give 24. Vidisky then made a synthesis by superimposing various elements, to give a runtime of around three and a half hours. It's a gargantuan undertaking, maybe the last of the kind of grand electronic music projects that seem so indicative of 20th century modernist optimism. Think of Xenarchus' Persepolis, staged in the ancient Iranian desert city of the same name, or Filipino composer Jose Mesida's piece Wignayen for 20 radio stations and thousands of members of the public. Anyhow, it seems apt that this piece, perhaps, was written right at the end of the century. I can only imagine what kind of experience it must have been to witness it all in situ. What we have now, of course, is the record, and as a listening experience, it's both real, grounded in cultural specifics, and surreal, discombobulating, and transcendent. That's in part, I think, due to the collage-like sonic approach, with many of the sounds being electronically manipulated. It has the stream-of-consciousness effect of something that if I was feeling fanciful, I might call a global dreamscape. But it's also due, I think, to the audacious schematization of the whole thing. Most of the movement titles are word plays or portmanteaus. So we have Vietnamibi, Alas Gamazoni, and so on, that reflect his plotting of points in the world that may lie within the same hemisphere, but which fall into different slices he made in his scheme. Apparently the only rule was to draw a straight line from wherever the hands of the clock were pointing, to any part of the planet, as long as it was inhabited. That then results in moving us often and with whiplash speed between widely different cultures, 
many of which we may only have a passing familiarity to. Of course, it's not an ethnographic document, though it is largely based on them in the form of field recordings. It's a piece of art, but even as such, you may question whether this could open itself up to the accusation of being perhaps the ultimate exercise in cultural appropriation and insensitivity. There is an argument that can be made for that, I think, but my sense would be to argue against it for a few reasons. One is that no one culture is being appropriated here. Every reference point, be it from the developed or developing world, seems to be treated equally. And also, again, it's not a commercial project, but an artwork, and one I'd suggest that through its sheer work ethic, if nothing else, transcends those types of labels. I also think it's just not in the spirit in which Pousseur thought or wrote. The accompanying booklet states that he renders homage to all the singers and instrumentalists, sound engineers, ethnomusicologists, and editors who have either produced, gathered, or transmitted all the marvellous musical invention which inspired and nourished the work, and which, with the sounds of the world, of nature, of society, and of industry, are supposed to represent a kind of formal summing up of life's multiplicity on this sailing earth as she travels through the cosmic space. The album Paysage Planétaire was released on Algo in 2011.
Such a great blending of strings and electronics. That was M number 1.2 and M number 1.7 that I played back to back by Belgian composer Pierre Slinkex. It's from the album M number 1. He's done three of these electroacoustic collaborations so far. 2019's C number 1 that pairs electronics with organ and last year's H number 1 scored for chamber ensemble and it was made in collaboration with the Kator MP4. He used a custom built portable computer that was equipped with two MIDI controllers and was developed alongside the musicians. I think that comes through in terms of how subtle the integration is. Sometimes these things can just sound a bit like strings with some electronics tacked on over the top for instance, but there really seems to be a satisfying integration going on here. So that was P.S. Dunkex on electronics and the Kator MP4 are Claire Baudet and Margaret Hermont, violin, Pierre Henault, viola and Meryl Havar on cello. The album M number no. one was released on Cyprus in 2019.
Well, it's the interspecies jam band you always wanted, and it's the one you've finally got. That was Vihuela and Wolfpack number one. A Vihuela is a Renaissance era Spanish string instrument. It's shaped like a guitar, but tuned more like a lute. And there was a second piece as well, Voices and Wolves, both by US composer, conceptual artist, and environmental activist Jim Norman. He's been a long-time associate of Greenpeace, directing one of their first overseas projects at Iki Island, Japan, where fishermen were slaughtering thousands of dolphins each year. And he's taken on consultancy roles for both National Geographic and the US Navy. Anyway, those two pieces are taken from his classic 1982 Folkways release with the rather brilliant title of Playing Music with Animals the interspecies communication of Jim Nolman with 300 turkeys, 12 wolves, and 20 orca whales. And just to be clear, all these are not field recordings with Vuela and so forth dubbed on after. They document Nolman out in the field, jamming with the animals in real time. In terms of the wolves, he said they were not too given too much to improvise to recall and response, and would promptly stop singing if we humans got too radical in our own response to them. I felt honoured whenever they would sing in harmony with my own playing. Related to this project, he's the founder of Interspecies, which sponsors artists' efforts to communicate with animals through music and art. Its best-known project is probably a 25-year study of using live music to interact with wild orcas off the west coast of Canada. He said that an artist's perception of nature is different from a scientist's. Biologists operate by the logic of perceiving the world objectively, symbolising their experience, doing their best to stand outside and separate, peeking in at nature, albeit observantly, sincerely, wholeheartedly. But to view nature from a perceived outside vantage also voids it of subject, diminishing a sense of personal connectedness, feeling, kinship, obligation, intuition, and other forms of direct relating. It is the way nature is commonly perceived in our culture. The objective vantage is the worldview overwhelmingly promoted by our educational system, the basis of most environmental policy and legislation, and the grounding of an economic system that denies intrinsic value to the natural world it so skillfully plunders. This objective vantage is so deeply entrenched within our culture that many people believe it is the only valid way to perceive our relationship with nature. This record was of course made before the extent of the current climate crisis was fully known, and some talk has been made in recent years of the granting of legal rights or personhood to animals and plants in a bid to arrest some of the destruction being wrought, but also perhaps as a tentative step towards a utopian vision of creating a more harmonic and equitable world between humans, non-humans, and nature at large. And art could and should have a place to play in this. Tellingly, Jim Norman describes the environmental crisis as a crisis in human perception, and says that art may be the best tool available for transforming that perception. Developing a more potent aesthetic dimension to our relations with nature is a crucial task as we prepare our battered world for generations unborn.
Using old time with contemporary classical chamber music. That's a version of Red Rocking Chair performed and arranged by Emily Pinkerton, a US based songwriter and ethnomusicologist who combines folk, popular, and chamber music. And it was made in collaboration with Patrick Burke, her husband and founding member of the Now Ensemble, who you heard playing there. The doleful Red Rocking Chair is based on recordings of renowned Appalachian musical dynasty, the Hammonds family's version of Sugar Babe. Who'll sing this song? 
or rock the cradle when I'm gone, the narrator laments. It's taken from her 2017 album, Rounder Songs, a cycle for voice, banjo and chamber ensemble. The songs are based on tunes and folk tales from Kentucky and West Virginia that tell stories of rounders, including a gambler, a murderer and a mill worker who strikes a deal with the devil. They're tunes that have been described as being cultivated, especially by young men, carefree and assertive in spirit, and with musical and lyrical structure deriving from African-American banjo song traditions. Musically, it's a mixing of worlds that seems natural and unforced. Maybe it's not so much of a stretch, in fact, but that's all to the credit of the arrangements and performances on the album. And perhaps as ever with such projects, there is a bit of a dynamic at work between the intention to honour the past and legacy of tradition, whilst also trying to move things forwards in a way that doesn't feel tokenistic or opportunistic. Emily Pinkerton has written, we approach this music as members of the old-time revival community, but as outsiders to the regional communities whose culture bearers perform these songs. We pursue this project with respect and commitment to the continued study of old times musical roots, the unlearning of whitewashed origin stories, and an understanding of how, as present performers, our work plays a part in either upholding or dismantling these narratives. That was performed by Emily Pinkerton on voice and banjo, and the now ensemble are Alex Sop, flute, Alicia Lee, clarinet, Mark Dan Seegers, electric guitar, Michael Mizrahi, piano, and Logan Cole, double bass. The album Round the Songs was released on New Amsterdam in 2017.
that's chords pulling one of the more introspective and for me standout moments of US pianist David Friend and composer Jerome Begin's recent duo album called Post. It's a set of solo piano pieces. My guess might be that they were part pre-composed, part improvised, with the addition of a live electronic processing in order to create a sense of a single hybrid instrument. Maybe that links in with David Friend's assertion that this is an album of queer music, one that is about disrupting binaries and breaking down what he considers highly gendered classifications in classical music. As a whole album, it's an often dramatic, sometimes slightly vertiginous listen through a range of styles in which the sound of the piano is warped and refracted to varying degrees. I like that piece in particular though, with those gorgeously plaintive chords and the subtle after effects that are sometimes reminiscent of prepared piano, while sometimes feeling more explicitly electronic. As mentioned, it was performed by David Friend Piano and Jerome Begin Electronics. The album Post was put out on New Amsterdam last year.
Kyrie, the first movement there of Sarah Kirkland Snyder's 2018 Mass for the Endangered. Based out of Brooklyn, she's the co-founder of New Amsterdam Records, who I've been featuring quite a bit of in this show. It's a great label, putting out some of the best US-based contemporary classical music. She's also a key part of the so-called indie classical scene in New York, resourceful musicians and composers who take a DIY approach to getting their music out there. This piece, commissioned by Trinity Wall Street as part of their Mass Reimaginings project, is written for SATB Choir with 12 instruments and has a libretto by Nathaniel Bellows. It's both a celebration of and an elegy for the natural world, as well as being an appeal for greater awareness and action. Sarah Kirkland Snyder has said its origin is rooted in humanity's concern for itself, expressed through worship of the divine, which in the Catholic tradition is a god in the image of man. Nathaniel and I thought it would be interesting to take the masses' musical modes of spiritual contemplation and apply them to concern for non-human life, animals, plants, and the environment. There is an appeal to a higher power for mercy, forgiveness, and intervention, but that appeal is directed not to God, but rather to nature itself. It's a musical language that mainly harks back to a Gregorian chant and the polyphonic style of composers like Palestrina, but to these ears, it's done with both sensitivity and sophistication. And whilst I'm not really sure as to the effects of artworks like this on enacting real change in the world, I find Chris Norman's approach more radical, to be honest. At the very least, it does provide pause for thought, along with being an engrossing performance that I would love to see live. It was performed there by Gal Cantus, and they were conducted by Gabriel Crouch. And it's from the album of the same name, Mass for the Endangered, that was released on New Amsterdam in 2020. Well, that's it for another one. The Tonic will be back on Wednesday the 14th of June at 1pm British Summertime, GMT plus one. As ever, you can check the show's Instagram page for confirmation of that, the underscore tonic underscore. And as ever, do drop me a message at any point via Instagram or thetonic.online. Special thanks to Helen, to B, and at Threads to Gabe, Rosie, Lee, Freddie, and the whole crew. I'm Luke Fraser. Thanks for listening.